morning we're going to go to James chapter 2. Several weeks ago I went through James chapter 1 with you. Today we're going to go to James chapter 2 and we'll try to cover the whole chapter and we're going to talk about a faith that is alive. You know there is something called in the Bible dead faith. Faith without works is dead. We don't want to have a dead faith, do we? We want to have a live, living faith. And so uh, that's what we're going to examine here in James chapter 2. <clears throat> now let's read here beginning right at the first verse. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Now, Heavenly Father, I ask you to be with us this day. And the Holy Spirit, I ask you to lead us and guide us and be our teacher. Go beyond the abilities of this uh, simple-minded man here standing. Lord, I need your help. I pray that you would speak to all of us through your word this morning. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want a living faith. And a living faith is not partial. It is not discriminatory. The glorious faith that we have, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, should never be associated with partiality, preferring one group over another, preferring one language group over another. I've often wondered here in our country why we have Spanish churches and English churches and <laughs> all these different churches. We say, well, because they're different uh, languages, they're different cultures. So we have to, well, um, I kind of think we all need to be one. <laughs> we ought to be careful. Now, I know there's sometimes that you have to speak to certain groups in certain ways. We have junior church uh, because we have people that want to speak to children in a certain way, but I want to give a warning. Don't do what some churches are doing today. And that is they stop the little children from coming into their sanctuary before they ever get into there. And they say, no, we don't have children in the sanctuary. Churches are doing that now. And they're saying, take the kids over there. Because this is not designed for them. Well, if it's not designed for them, make it designed for them. <laughs> make it so the children are comfortable. That's not to say uh, there isn't a time where you take the children off. There may be a time that you take young girls off and you speak to them, young teenage girls, speak to them alone. There may be those times. But generally speaking, the gospel should not be parsed out in a partial way. Now, it's important to remember here that James was writing to a, a world much more filled with discrimination than our own. Here in America, I know there are those that want to make us seem like a big racist country and a big sexist country. We're not, not by any stretch of the imagination, not compared to what James was writing to. They divided over whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, whether you were a slave or free, whether you were rich or poor, whether you were Greek or barbarian and so forth. We don't really do that. We kind of know in our culture that all men are created equal. You see, a significant aspect of the work of Jesus was to break down the walls that normally divide humanity and to bring one new race of mankind to, to, to him. We, in Christ, we, in Christ, there's no male or female or black or white or 
whatever. We're one in Christ. We're one family. Ephesians chapter two, verse 14 and 15 says, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So the unity and the <clears throat> openness of the uh, of the early church was an astonishment to the people of those days. It was like, wow, they're actually fellowshipping free people with slave people. Can you imagine that? Well, that's how the gospel really is. Whenever you divide into strict, strictly racial groups or cultural groups or whatever, I think we're missing something. James calls uh, uh, the, the assembly of the believers uh, something that is a regular occurrence. Let me ask you this. Do you regularly go to church? <laughs> Do you regularly meet with God's people? You should. And so James is assuming that you're going to come and you're going to be together. He's just warning us that when we come together, not to, not to be partial. In the Roman society, the wealthy wore rings on their left hand in great amounts. They looked like Dino or who was the other guy? Was it Liberace that had a bunch of rings all over his fingers? These were signs of wealth, and these rings were worn in those days uh, just to show how much money you had. Now, that kind of open show really doesn't have a place in the church, you know. Uh, don't do that. Don't try to draw attention to yourself. Uh, we don't want the rich to rule over the poor. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want us to just be involved in or interested in the externals, but we need to be concerned about what's inside a person. And uh, we ought to be open to everybody. And uh, that's an important thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse five through nine. Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But you've despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Listen, we're talking about a lively faith, a living faith. A living faith is not prejudice. Now, though it may be easy, at least in our minds, to be partial to the rich, God is not partial to the rich. Did you know that? In fact, since riches can be an obstacle to the kingdom of God, as Jesus said in Matthew 19, there is a sense in which the poor of this world are especially blessed by God. God keeps his eyes on them. In Matthew 19, 24, Jesus said, and again, I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When we judge people on outward appearance and character, we miss the mind of God. We remember that Judas appeared to be so much better leadership material than Peter, that he was given responsibility over the uh, treasury. Judas probably looked good on the outside. James reminds us here <clears throat> that the rich are the very ones who often sin against the poor. You know why? Because there are some people that will do anything for money. And uh, for that reason alone, uh, we should not prefer the rich. First Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, 
which while some coveted after it, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's not to say that, the, that just because you have uh, riches or you have substance that you're a bad person. Not at all. But it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. If, the, if money is what you're all about, you better be careful and watch it. Now, James here is anticipating that some of his readers might defend their partiality to the rich as simply loving him as their neighbor in obedience to the law. But partiality is against the law. And James wants you to know that. Our God is a great king and his law is a royal law. But this command has the particular emphasis of Jesus in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. And here's what Jesus said. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. <clears throat> Interesting. If you look back at verse 9, um, it says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Convinced means convicted. And it's convicted. Now, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So in context here, he's talking about being partial or, you know, being discriminatory against people. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and do, so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For she, he shall have judgment without mercy, that has shown no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. In context, this scripture here is talking about treating people fairly and loving both the rich and the poor. James here guards against selective obedience. That is, people who pick and choose which commands of God they'll obey. No, you should obey all of them. And this law of love is the most important. We're under the law of liberty, that's true. We have liberty in Christ, yet there is a law that must be obeyed. And that is we must love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. Let me ask you this. If you had a loving son or a loving grandchild and they came into church in rags and dirty and smelly, uh, you know what you would do? Uh, you would welcome them into church and you would have them sit next to you. And then after church, you might go get them some nice clean clothes and help them wash up, you know? Because that's what love does. Love shows mercy to others. And it refrains from partiality. The mercy we show to others will be extended to us one day. We will be judged according to the mercy we show others. Isn't that amazing? Well, verse 14 through 17 what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Well, let's stop right there and think about that verse first. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Well, James thinks it's impossible that somebody that is genuinely saved, somebody that has genuine saving faith, it's impossible for them to have no works. One can say he has faith, but show forth no good works. Can that kind of faith save him? James is saying no. See, these were Jewish Christians who discovered the glory of salvation by faith. But now, 
having been freed from the works uh, righteousness that they that they had uh, gone to the extreme of thinking uh, that a walk with God was. Now they're swinging over the other way. It's like, it doesn't matter what I do. But James does, does not agree with that. Now he's not contradicting Paul, who insisted that we are not saved of works. You know, Ephesians 2, 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. James is not disagreeing with that. James merely is clarifying for us the kind of faith that saves. He's defining true saving faith. We are saved by faith, not by works, but saving faith will have works that accompany it. Otherwise, it's dead. Paul also understood the necessity of works improving the character of our faith, for we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10 says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This is a faithful saying, Titus 3, eight, And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. That's the Apostle Paul talking. Does that sound like he's in opposition to James? He's not. These things are good and profitable unto all men. James has this in view. That faith, true saving faith, is proven by works. Faith alone saves. But the faith that saves is not alone. Do you you get that? (laughs) Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. The works are there. Now look at verse 15. If a brother or sister, oh, I'm sorry, I was right there, there we go, yeah. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, depart in peace and be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye, give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now this is pretty straightforward, right? This may be verse 17, even so faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. When you put it into the context of not being partial and caring about the needs of other people and the love of God, it makes more sense. To fail in the simple good work toward a brother or sister that is in need demonstrates that one does not have a true living faith. And we can only be saved by a living faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't give a hoot about other people and you don't love other people, you're nothing. 1 Corinthians 13 says that. True saving faith results in works. To say to somebody, be warm and filled, demonstrates that the person in question knows the needs of the destitute brothers or sisters around them, yet does nothing to help. That's bad. How can you call yourself a Christian? Real faith has works that accompany it. And they're not made up of only spiritual things, but also things that concern basic needs like food and clothing. I say this of my mother. I know my mother loved me because my mother always watched my feet. (laughs) My mother would, and she never told me, but... I would come over to her house and next thing I know, she'd be putting a new pair of shoes on me. She knew my size and she watched my feet. I think that's how she, uh, you know, I was talking to a wealthy businessman who we all know here, but I won't mention his name. uh, And he told me how he judged people. He judged them by their men. He judged men by their belts. He would look at their belts and if they were worn and old, If everything else looked great, but the belt was worn and old, then he knew that the guy didn't have much money. My mother would watch my feet, and she knew when I needed shoes, and she would just take care of that for me. Boy, I was thankful for that. 
You know, when needs arise around you and you see a need that you can meet the need. Now, my mother, my mother had the money that she could go and buy those shoes. And I'm thankful that she loved me enough to, to do that. If you are aware of certain needs and you have the wherewithal to take care of that need, do it in the name of the Lord. That's what, a, that's what true saving faith looks like. It shows itself when we help those who need help. Now, the law must be kept as a whole. If you're going to be justified by the law, if you, if you offend in one area, then you've broken it all. You can't offend in this area. You, you have to, you can't just say, well, be at peace and be warned. If you've got the wherewithal to take care of the person's need, do that. It's interesting when you study the whole chapter and see the context of this idea that faith without works is dead. Paul is talk, or James here is just talking about loving other people. And a living faith expresses itself in a genuine love and concern for others. <clears throat> Verse 18 through 20. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Oh, I love this. James says, show me thy faith without thy works. And I'll show you the... I'll show thee my faith by my works. Now, friends, works don't save us. That's true. But they're the evidence of the faith that we have. The reason works don't save you is because anybody could buy shoes for somebody else. That doesn't prove that you're, you're born again. But somebody that's born again is going to buy the shoes because that's just part of their character. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Some might try to say that works are the gift of some, while faith is the gift of others. But James is going to have none of that. James says real faith is is going to be demonstrated by practical works. The appeal of James is clear and logical. We can't see someone's faith, but we can sure see their works. You can't see faith without works, but you can demonstrate the reality of faith by works. You can know somebody loves you if when you have a need, they, they, they help you with it. You can know somebody doesn't love you <laughs> That when you have a need, they ignore you or turn away from you. The fallacy of faith without works is demonstrated by this reference to the demons. The demons have a dead faith in God. They have an acknowledgement of his existence and of his attributes. But their faith is dead. You know all that their faith does? The faith of demons, if you can call it faith. It's a dead faith. If you can call it, it causes them to tremble at God. They tremble and shake. Faith, true saving faith, shows itself in action. Now verse 21. We're given two examples here. The first is Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? We could put an answer in there. Let's answer James. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? The answer is yes. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Wow. Put that on your signpost out front of your church. By works a man is justified and not by faith only. They, you, there's a lot of people call you a heretic, but you're taking it right out of the word of God. Abraham was justified by faith long before his offering of Isaac, of Isaac. You realize that, right? It was in Genesis 15 when he was justified by faith. It was long before 
the thing with Isaac. But his willingness to offer Isaac was a demonstration that he really did trust God. You see, the works completed his faith. Genesis 15, 6 says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. The faith that justifies a man is a faith <clears throat> that has works. A faith that is without works is a dead faith. I'll say it again. A true faith, that saving faith that is shown to be true is shown by its good works. And it's only that kind of faith that will justify. Works must accompany a genuine faith because a genuine faith is always connected with regeneration, being born again. A person that becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus is different. They're changed. And if there's no evidence of a new life, if there's no transformation, you're not, you, you don't have saving faith. There's no genuine saving faith. I know so many people that, that, that think that they can live like the devil. And it doesn't matter what they do. They're going to be welcomed into heaven with open arms. You better examine yourself to see whether you even be in the faith. The faith you have might be the, the faith of demons. A dead faith. It ought to cause you to tremble. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You know what Charles Spurgeon said? <clears throat> oh, wait, let me go on from there. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, the grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. That's good. The grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. You say, well, I'm saved. It's all about grace. It's all about grace. Do you realize you can have the grace of God and not be saved? God's gracious to everybody. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The beautiful day that we have out here is the unmerited favor of God. He is blessing not only the saints, but the sinners. God is good. But the grace that does not change your life is not a grace that will save your soul. If you are not born again, if you haven't been transformed, if you haven't been, if you don't have works manifesting in your life, then your faith is dead. You say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, my sins are forgiven past, present, and future. You better, you better examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith or not. I have a sneaky suspicion your faith is dead if it doesn't result and end up with good works. Now, we're given another example um, here in verse 25 and 26. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them away, then out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Hmm. The body without the spirit is a scriptural definition of death. The spirit doesn't die, the body does. Faith without works is like a dead body. You're the walking dead. You go around thinking you're a Christian and you have no transformation in your life. You're not motivated by love. You're partial against other people. 1 Corinthians 13 applies to you. You're a clanging bell and a tinkling cymbal. You have, you have no works manifested in your life. That is dead faith. Now, Rahab demonstrated her trust. This prostitute demonstrated her trust in the God of Israel by hiding the spies and seeking salvation from their God. Yet her faith did something. Her belief in the God of Israel would not have saved her if she had done nothing uh, about that. She did something with her faith. 
In Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 13, we read about Rahab. It says, And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven alone and in earth beneath. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. This is interesting, isn't it? These two examples of living faith. First of all was Abraham, a faith that works. And the second of all was Rahab. These two examples. They kind of don't seem like they belong in the same slide, you know. Here is Abraham, the father of the Jews, and Rahab, a Gentile. Here you have Abraham, a, a man that was very uh, uh, righteous in his outlook and in his deeds, although he wasn't perfect, yet he was a godly man. And Rahab is a prostitute. Perhaps here, James is subtly rebuking the partiality that may have developed on the part of some of the Jewish Christians against Gentile believers. Because he is using a Jew and a Gentile. He is using a male and a female. It may be that the same thing that James was talking about at the beginning of this chapter, he's continuing on. Don't be partial. Partial. The lesson from Abraham's life is clear. If we believe in God, we will do what he tells us to do, right? That seems so basic and simple. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I tell you? If you're not living a life that's pleasing to the Lord, if you're not doing what the Lord wants you to do, you better examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. You may be a fault. You may have dead faith. You better examine it. The lesson from Rahab's life is also very clear. If we believe in God, we will help his people, even at our own expense. Can't get much clearer than that, I don't think. A living faith is a faith that is alive <laughs> and does things. As much as you can have a body with no life, that's called a corpse. So you can have faith with no life. You know, it's possible to have a dead faith. And that dead faith is unable to save. And so I guess as we close today, I would encourage uh, anyone who's listening to me now uh, to examine themselves to see whether they be in the faith. You think you're going to be saved because you have faith without works. You show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. If you are showing partiality, if you are discriminating against people based on their wealth, based on their race, based on their gender or whatever, um, shame on you. You better examine because your faith probably is dead. It's not a false faith. It's a faith that ought to, if, if you had any sense, it'd make you tremble. But uh, anyway, well, let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank, I thank you for this book of James and how clear he lays things out for us. 
Father, we want to have works that are pleasing to you. You said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And Lord, we want to be a little light shining in this dark world. Help us, Lord. And uh, Father, although we know we're not saved by our works, we are saved unto good works. And Lord, help us to shine brightly for you. We want to be like those five wise virgins who had extra oil so they could shine all night long. Lord, help us to be that way. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Now be with my friends this day. Amen. Amen. <music>